this whole field is so new that nobody can agree on what to call it. And in fact, one of my one of my heroes, Dr. Herb Lin, has published a whole series of papers on this topic, and in each paper, he comes up with a new acronym to describe the same thing. So I can't even just pick my favorite researcher and follow his naming convention. So we'll see, we'll see whose names win. What I'm focusing on is cyber-enhanced influence operations and propaganda. With traditional cybersecurity, the end result of any operation is usually not something on a computer, in some cases it is. Maybe you want to shut down a power grid. In some cases you want to steal someone's password. Maybe you want to steal some company's emails or IP or something like that. There, there's a kind of a raging debate going on right now as to, to what extent is this a part of cyber? To what extent is it a whole new thing? My position here is that we have to think of it through the lens of cybersecurity and apply a security model. There's still a lot of work to be done there. But there's some very new characteristics to this. And in my opinion, one of the most important new characteristics is the fact that you can have an operation where the goal is to change the entire demographic balance of a whole country, of a whole population, uh, in a very short space of time using these very powerful modern communication tools. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction of how powerful a weapon I think it is. None of this should really be unfamiliar to you. So in 2016, there were a few different things that happened. Uh, our intelligence agencies repeatedly reported that there were Russian attacks underway on the US election system. There were probably many congressional hearings. There was one Senate hearing right in the first week of December. It was widely reported, actually all throughout the year, this was widely reported in very respectable standard news sources. Also, in 2016, the outrageous, absurd conspiracy theory known as Pizzagate appeared. The very first Twitter and Reddit posts were October 30th through November 4th. There was no mention of this anywhere in the literature anywhere before October 30th. Uh, it rapidly received a great deal of attention on well-known fake news sites, TV shows, stuff like that. It was spread by prominent figures. A poll taken December 17th through 20th now remember, November 4th was the first time that anything about pizza appeared. In this poll, 54% of the population believed what our intelligence services were telling us with a high degree of confidence. 32% of the population believed what some random nobody on the internet was saying that was totally obvious nonsense. After less than two months of the idea being in existence at all, so how did such a small idea achieve such penetration so rapidly? I'm not even, this, and remember this is 2016, I don't even know what the numbers are now, but I still run into people who are 100% convinced that not only is this true, but it's also the single most important fact that they spend all of their time thinking about. Now what's really terrible is if you break it down by party, more than half of Trump voters at that, at that time, this is that same poll, something's covering it up here, believed this, and of course, because of the fact that we have a two-party system, when you have a party that's in control, if a adversary wanted to control uh, the way the policy was being made, you can kind of ignore the people who are out of power and just influence the base of the politicians who are in power, and then those politicians generally have to be responsive to their base. Kind of, uh, we can debate whether the politicians themselves are tending to be reasonable people, but they have to be responsive to their base. And what's additionally shocking about this is that Republicans have traditionally been the party of national security, of law and order, of conservative values, and yet they nearly, reje nearly unanimously rejected the wisdom of our own national security community as a result of what I would propose would be an influence operation by a hostile intelligence service, a hostile foreign intelligence service. There's zero geopolitical significance to a uh, pizza restaurant. So what was the real objective here? This is a whole bunch of graphs, and you know the, I violated one of the rules of making a slide by putting way too much information on here. But every single one of these graphs shows a very sudden, very sharp uptick in favorability of Russia, or Putin specifically, starting around 2016. So 
the politicians have to be responsive to the base, and if the population can be manipulated by a hostile adversary nation so that the political base is now favorable to that country, then that's obviously going to have a dramatic impact on the way our country relates to this other country. And this happened very, very quickly. At the same time, you also have this very rapid shift in the trust of our own institutions, our own national security apparatus. And uh, this right here is actually a poll on how people feel about WikiLeaks, which, which the CIA describes as a non-state hostile intelligence agency. It suddenly has become net favorable among the base that the politicians have to respond to. And this isn't obvious. I'm primarily going to be focusing on America here, but just to give you an example of how else this might be going in other places in the world, another issue that has important geopolitical implications for Russia is Brexit as a sort of subcategory of breaking down NATO alliances and stuff like that. And you notice that there was a very sudden shift in opinion right before the vote itself. And then, that's funny, once the campaign got what it wanted, people kind of went back to thinking what they originally thought. I'm claiming, and I think a lot of people here are going to continue to reinforce the idea that an ongoing PSYOP campaign has been extremely effective at manipulating public sentiment and beliefs in the US in ways favorable to Russia, and we can only expect this to get worse. I'm, I'm kind of the good cop today. The people that come after me are much scarier people. This is a sort of a high-level outline of everything I'm going to present here. I'm going to start with a prologue on cognitive bias. Uh, my doctorate is in psychology with a focus on uh, attention and emotion and how they relate to cognition. I'm going to, this is, it's already too big of a field with too little knowledge, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of a sampling which is by no means comprehensive. I'm going to describe a few things in detail of what somebody, uh, well actually I'm going to describe one example of a real world thing that was done in this field that I got from interviewing someone. And then I'm going to describe some theoretical things in terms of models of what might be going on at a big picture level. I'm going to talk about who the players are here, obviously government and private corporations, and what each of them can and can't do realistically. And I'm not going to give you a comprehensive security framework, but the good news is that that is being worked on and you'll get to hear a lot more about it later today. So, prologue on cognitive bias. If there's only one thing that, I, that you take away from this, it goes in the prologue because it's not really a part of the rest of the talk, but there's only one thing that you remember from what I'm saying is that you suffer from cognitive bias. Almost every talk I've ever seen on cognitive bias People you know, who are making the, any number of academics and pseudo-academics and intellectuals and pseudo-intellectuals, this is a very popular topic right now. You have the I fucking love science crowd, people giving these public talks, TED talks, everything. Everybody's really into cognitive biases. And at the end of every talk, I think back and I'm like, yeah, they just gave us a bunch of statistics on how biased everyone else is. I, you know, I write on the little question card, yeah, but are we biased? And then the, like, the guy's sorting through the cards and he throws that one away. Nobody wants to hear that. Getting into a little bit of the detail here, the way that you think about cognitive bias, this is an approach that many people use. You have system one, which is fast, approximate, intuitive. You have system two, which is slow and careful. Emotions bias us to use system one. I'm going through this very quickly because you can read all about this elsewhere. Biases generally err towards self-consistency and social consistency. You're gonna believe the things that reinforce what you already believe, you're going to believe the things that reinforce your image of the kind of person you are. And social consistency. You're going to believe the things that are consistent with your social group. You're going to believe the things that help you fit into your social group. And you're going to believe the things that reinforce your sense of what your social group is. Like if you think your social group is a bunch of good people and then you read a news article that says somebody that sounds like one of your peers did something bad, you're probably not going to believe that news article because my people don't do stuff like that. These biases affect everyone, including you. What can I do about my own bias? After I made these slides, I came up with the, the, the phrase that I like, which is you can red team your own brain. 
So your intuition won't debias you because your intuition is system one. That's what makes the bias. Willpower won't debias you. That's like an addict trying to quit by white knuckling it. This, I spent 10 years as a scientist and one of the things that was most frustrating to me was that as part of science education that you're supposed to be objective and you end up with all these scientists who are like, damn, I'm really objective because I'm a scientist. And they're not. I'm gonna suggest maybe what you might think of as bias hygiene, which is an actual practice that you can use as a habit to try to do something about this. Learn the types of bias so you know what to look for in your own thinking. Remember to assume you're biased and then use habits of a pre-flight checklist and a debriefing checklist. So again, there, you, like, the Wikipedia has this amazing list of cognitive biases and there's no shortage of really good materials on this. I think that they fall short in emphasizing to people that you should take this personally on the inside rather than just reading about it for academic interest. The wrong way to do this is a sense of identity. Like I said, I'm a scientist. Yeah, I'm a great scientist, look how objective I am. The problem is that the way that the cognitive bias works, it's gonna trick you into thinking you're not biased when you really are, because that's a self-serving bias to think you're not biased once you've started thinking about it. And once you've convinced yourself you're not biased, then you're worse off than a neutral person who hasn't asked the question yet. The right way to do this and I don't, you know, I can't give you citations for this, but it seems like this is, the, this is the obvious conclusion of all the research and literature on this. So you have a pre-flight checklist. When you have to make an important decision, you can do things like ask for a second opinion. You can do things like ask yourself, well, if I, assuming that I'm biased, I feel like I'm making the right decision, but if I were biased, which direction am I probably biased in? So, you know, I kind of know what my belief system is. I'm probably the kind of person who's more likely to believe that that used car salesman is telling me the truth because I'm just a nice guy and I like to believe that, that it's, the world is a nice place. And turns out used car salesman wasn't telling me the truth and I should have questioned my reasoning a little bit. So then you can consciously edit your decision after you sort of ask this question about yourself and it's gonna feel wrong because your intuition is telling you to do one thing and then you're trying, to t you're trying to decide on purpose to do something other than what your intuition says, but that's okay because your systems will adapt over time with practice, your intuition adjusts to what you've been doing. And then debrief afterwards, so which direction did I err? Was it the direction I thought it would be? Is that consistent with my self-image? And how well did my pre-flight efforts work? Like, did I actually correct myself in the right direction? Did I go far enough? Did I go too far? What could I do differently next time? And if you make this a practice of habits, you do slowly adapt over time. It's an ongoing journey. You're never not biased, but you can sort of figure things out one at a time and clear them up and maybe do better as you go along. So there is hope, but we never win this battle. Okay, so repeating this for the hundredth time, you have cognitive bias. All right, now let's get back to PSYOP, the cyber-enabled influence operations here. So, like I said, I'm gonna give one example that came from an interview with someone who works in this field. This is a very simple example. I'm not getting into the big population level yet. You have two startups. They both accidentally chose the same name. One of them has a bigger budget. Both of them are otherwise pretty well balanced. You know, it's not like one of them has all the brilliant people or something like that. Now the underdog is thinking, we don't have as much of a marketing budget, but what can we do to win this battle over the namespace? So you turn to social media and you're thinking, what we want is we want people, when they search for, our name, when they search for this name, they wanna see us and not the other ones. So that's search engine optimization. So what are the factors that influence that? Well, you have this, there's the community, like are people talking about you on social media? There, are there articles being written in blogs? Are there you know, tweets going out, Facebook posts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Reddit, there's all these different forums. So you start by maybe, you make a whole bunch of accounts for yourself. You make sock puppet accounts, you go through a VPN so that each one of the accounts does not appear to be coming from all the same places because they're on they're onto that. They figured that one out. If you're on the same computer and you have a whole bunch of accounts, then they'll figure that out right away. 
somebody, you know, this would be like the, Saint, the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. Like the job that these people are doing is that they're running a whole bunch of sock puppet accounts. Each person kind of has to keep track of a bunch of different personae. There have been a lot of good interviews with these people where they sort of describe how this process works. You start posting messages, you build up some enthusiasm about this, and you figure out who the people are who kind of get on board, whoever's the most enthusiastic. And then some of your sock puppet accounts maybe make friends with a few of these people and fire up their passion, and then maybe you talk someone into writing an article for you. So then they post an article, and then your sock puppets go and give them some comments. Maybe they make a Reddit post or a tweet or something. You build up some likes, some favorites. Now, you can also go on the dark web and you can just buy 200 whatever likes or favorites or upvotes or whatever. Now, of course, that's also kind of obvious. Like if, a po if somebody posts something on Reddit and then all of a sudden it has 200 instantly upvotes, everybody's gonna figure out that there's something sketchy going on there. So you have to kind of like first build it up as carefully as you can and then maybe once you have 153 natural likes or upvotes, then you can go on the dark web and add another 72 and nobody will really notice that jump. So you can speed it up as you go along. And when you put all this together, it can end up being very powerful. And in this particular case, the marketing person that I talked to said that this was a successful venture and they actually got the underdog to win this battle the company that had a bigger marketing budget ended up having to change their name. Now, that's kind of execution tactics in the trenches. How would you do large-scale political manipulation? One of the things that I think is particularly important in this space is the role of conspiracy theories, as I mentioned before. I think there are a lot of ways that conspiracy theories can be really useful. You're probably all familiar with the Nigerian 419 scams been around for ages, one of the biggest sort of, uh, people just think of it as scams, but in a way it's a kind of influence operation. You get an email, it's in all capital letters, it looks like it was written by a three-year-old. How do people fall for this? It's, you know, they, they're, they're stupid. Are these scammers just idiots? What's going on here? Well, there's a whole bunch of research on this. You can read articles going all the way back to, I think 2001 was the first one I found where they're explaining that the, the stupidity of the scam article, the, of the scam email is in fact a part of the process. Because you want to make sure, like anything where you're sending out emails or social media messages or whatever, cold calling, you always expect a very, very low response rate. So they'll send out a million emails and then they'll get 100 responses. And then once they get 100 responses, then they have to start talking to those people and they don't want to like spend five hours talking to someone and then it doesn't go anywhere. So you wanna make sure that the people who respond are dumb as dirt so you can take advantage of them. And that's why the scammers figured out that they should write these 419 scam emails full of typos and misspellings. So if you wanna manipulate the population, who are you gonna start with? Are you gonna to try to manipulate you know, the most careful, rational people who've been trained in cognitive bias, et cetera, et cetera? No, you're gonna try to figure out who the most gullible nuts are. So maybe you go into the world of conspiracy theories. I've always been a fan of conspiracy theories. I used to listen to Art Bell radio a long time ago. You have the lizard people, you have uh, the moon landing was faked. You have the flat earth people, you have the 13 crystal skulls, you have the Anunnaki and the mystery of the pyramids. Don't even get started on uh, alien autopsies at Area 51. That was always a perennial favorite. It all used to be fun and games. Like I remember very clearly, there was always like this whole world of conspiracy theories. It was so fascinating, this modern mythology of how these ideas sort of grew organically and spread. But if you go out on the internet right now and you look around, what you see is that there's all those conspiracy theories are still there. But what you find is that there's these sort of totalizing uber conspiracy theories that have scooped a lot of people up. So, you know, you might find one guy who believes this and one guy who believes this and one guy who believes this, but now they all believe Pizzagate, for example, or QAnon is kind of the current, I don't know, 
even what, that's a scary thing right there. So you don't really care about the individuals, you just care about the demographics, which is one of the reasons why it's okay to focus on gullible people. Like you don't need these people to be, individu to be individually influential or important in any way, you just need there to be a whole bunch of people. Let me back up for a second here. Well, another image to keep in mind is, who's heard of the cinnamon challenge on the internet? Or any of these other like teenage something something challenges where somebody posts a YouTube video and all of a sudden all the teenagers are like, oh, I wonder if I could do that. So if you look in the news, I mean, you'll find any number of mainstream news articles about the cinnamon challenge. Now, if I went to a reporter before the cinnamon challenge was a thing, if I'd gone to a reporter and I said, hey, will you write an article for me about how maybe you might want to eat a tablespoon full of oregano, they would just look at you like, what? That's insane. Like, I'm not gonna write an article about why you should eat a spoonful of oregano, that's nonsense. But after <laughs> the cinnamon challenge became a thing, that, like somehow millions of teenagers tried it and then just the fact that a bunch of people were eating spoonfuls of cinnamon by that automatically that automatically makes it newsworthy it's something that the news can report on and now if you go and you talk to them about eating a spoonful of oregano that's not really that crazy of an idea cuz eating a spoonful of oregano is way less painful and dangerous than eating a spoonful of cinnamon so now think of this the other way. Imagine that you were an, a marketing person for an oregano firm and <laughs> you were trying to sell more oregano and you had no ethics and you just wanted to use the dynamics of the internet to spread this stuff around. What if you got a few people to eat a spoonful of cinnamon, you know, just pay some actors to eat a spoonful of cinnamon, it's like jackass style, and then they're like coughing and choking, it's really dramatic, everybody's laughing, the can't, you know, the handheld camera's shaking around. You post a few of these on YouTube, and then you do what I said. You like hire some dark web favorites on YouTube, you build a little bit of an online community. Before you know it, the news is talking about the cinnamon challenge, and then you jump in and you're like, hey, I can say anything I want about oregano. My oregano company, they wouldn't listen to me if I asked them to publish an article about eating spoonfuls of oregano before, but now they will, and suddenly you're rolling in oregano money. This idea that there are things that you can't get the media to talk about, but then later you can, this raises the concept of the Overton window. So it was originally defined just on the left-right spectrum of like, you know, the regular public discourse, you know, if a politician goes and proposes uh, single-payer health care, maybe that is something that's within the discussion, but if a politician proposes uh, to choose a historical example, uh, grinding up Irish babies, when was that, the 1800s, and using them for food, then there is outrage, everybody freaked out. Uh, so there are things that are outside the Overton window, they're not okay to talk about. And this is a media phenomenon, it's a societal level phenomenon, it's not a question of what do you think is acceptable, it's a question of the media ecosystem, what shows up what, what's allowed and what isn't allowed. Like if you're on TV and you start talking about something, they're like, oh, cut to commercial. Yeah, if you really wanna talk about all the things that might be acceptable in media discourse, obviously just left, right doesn't cover it in any reasonable way, it probably never did, but now it especially doesn't because there's so many different things for people to talk about. The people have used the idea of the Nolan plot in political economics for a while, where you can sort of define people in a liberal conservative axis on social and economic, there's actually a lot more than two dimensions. So you can extend this to multiple dimensions, like how many different issues are there that people might have political beliefs on that aren't all just on one spectrum. Uh, th there are people that I know that have worked at companies that have done this. The answer is that there are a bunch. There may be roughly 12 dimensions-ish, 10 or 12. It kind of depends on various factors, how you define it, like where do you draw the line? But anyway, you can't really visualize 12 dimensions, so I'm gonna show you this, I'm gonna go back to using this Nolan plot because it's easier to put a two-dimensional image up on the screen. Now, the Overton window, as a very rough approximation, you could say 
that where there is population density on the chart, that's the Overton window. And where there's nobody, that's outside the Overton window. So somewhere in there, that's the stuff that you can probably get away with talking about. And way out there in the fringe, that you can't get away with talking about that. And just think, I'm not gonna be specific about the details here, but you could use the, the, uh, the oregano and the cinnamon as an example here. So maybe eating oregano would be here and eating cinnamon would be here because it's more painful, but nobody does that. So it's all off the table. What about this here? Like if you just, there's two clusters here. So if you just thresholded the clusters, there's kind of an empty space in the middle. Well, as a thought experiment, consider abortion as a hot button political issue that's pretty polarized. People are pretty extreme in their beliefs about abortion. Now, if you brought somebody onto a talk show and they said, uh, I propose a very moderate halfway compromise position, that's fine. But, you know, it's, it's, generally it's okay to talk about moderation and compromise. That doesn't make you sound crazy, even if no one actually believes that. Now, if you take this and turn that into mathematical terms on the basis of this representation in a multi-dimensional space, what I'm just described is that you're taking the convex hull of the distribution or the convex hull of the threshold surface of the distribution. So I'm sort of postulating that compromise positions fit within the Overton window. This was the example here. So I'm calling this the Overton convex hull. So that looks like that when you draw it. Now, this helps you start thinking about population level techniques of how you could start shifting this. The foot in the door technique, this is taking this from the, both persuasion literature and also occasionally in the literature on the Over, Overton window. If you wanna stretch the Overton window a little bit at a time, so you know, you're trying to tell people to eat spoonfuls of oregano, the, you know, the old fashioned way would be to sort of start a marketing campaign and kind of gradually warm people up to the idea of eating spoonfuls of oregano, which might take a long time. It's time and resource intensive. Now, what if you wanna do it much more rapidly? You wanna get people to rapidly change their opinions of, on something en masse. So again, in the existing literature, they, they refer to this as the door in the face technique instead of the foot in the door technique. You start with an extreme position to make room for a less extreme position. And like I said, here's the example of the cinnamon challenge. <laughs> yeah, I don't even wanna talk about Tide Pods. So you, you create, what you're doing is you're creating this cluster out here in the fringe. This might be the cinnamon challenge. Use the techniques to like sort of bootstrap this and suddenly there's a fringe group of people who are eating spoonfuls of cinnamon. Now because of the convex hull, basically everything in there is now okay to talk about on the media. So now your oregano example is fine. I think it's pretty obvious this summary here of my, why you might wanna do all this stuff, but this is just a summary of that here. And what I would say is when you ask these questions of how did you suddenly get a whole bunch of people to believe that the FBI was bad, the CIA is bad, Russia is good, Putin is good, where did all these people come from? You know, you might want to look at the conspiracy theorists. I don't, you know, I think I'm just gonna leave it at that. One way of thinking about this is we know back in the Cold War it was well known that one of the many widely used techniques of Russian influence was the idea of useful idiots. There were any number of people who were not compromised, but they were just sort of like indirectly encouraged to say what the Soviets wanted them to say. And at a population level, you could call this a weaponized demographic, where you have a whole group of people that has become, no one individual is themselves a tool of the adversary, but the demographic collectively 
is being steered by the adversary in ways that are favorable to their policy desires. You, I'm, I'm postulating this in a little bit, I'll come to what you would do to actually sort of test this and find out if it's true. One of the things that you would do is if you had access to enough data on the population beliefs and you saw this pattern occur very suddenly and then you could trace it down to the sort of networks of accounts that were, or news sites or whatever, that were driving the change and you could trace it back to a certain source, you could identify a campaign here you may not even be able to identify any of the particular individuals involved, but you could look at this pattern, you could look at the social graph patterns, you could look at the content patterns, you could see that something like this was going on. At the level of abstraction that I've described it, you could detect this without necessarily needing the kind of detection that would be necessary, the, the kind of detection that you would be thinking of from sort of a law enforcement point of view, or even possibly from a traditional intelligence point of view. This multi-dimensional space is what I would say is the actual battlefield. This abstract space of ideas is the battlefield that these influence operations are taking place on. The good news is that we have all this data. It is very easy to map these things out. In fact, I would say that part of the reason that this is possible now is exactly because we are adversaries are able to visualize the battlefield on this level. This is the kind of thing that they did at Cambridge Analytica behind closed doors all of this data dimension reduction, they specifically did do that. Uh, you know, multi-dimensional data reduction manifolds, that doesn't really get a lot of headlines, but this is kind of what they were actually doing among many other things. Micro-targeting gets a lot more press because it's creepy to think, oh, Russia was paying Cambridge Analytica to pay Facebook to look in my underwear drawer. But I think that this sort of thing may have actually been much more important. Oh yeah, just as a side note here, foreshadowing here, I'm gonna talk about what we can do about this. You start looking at counter-offensive measures. There are certain limits to how unethical you want to be with your counter-offensive measures. And the good news is that everything I just said, re sort of reframing it a bit, you can do this without any personal data. You can do it without looking in anyone's underwear drawer. Now I'm gonna start talking about what the different players involved here can and can't do. And uh, you know, I'm sort of gonna imply without necessarily saying it that maybe we should be encouraging these different players to do these things more than they already are. One of the things you hear all the time is why doesn't whatever tech company just ban or delete all of the bots or Russians or troll farms or whatever. This if there's a second thing that I want you all to take home from this, it's please don't think like this because this is not helping. I think there's gonna be a lot more about that in one of the upcoming talks too. The signals are too noisy. There's a well-known thing in public health. You know, somebody might ask the question, why don't we just give everyone an AIDS test? Problem solved. Well, the answer is that if the test has a false positive rate of 0.1% and the rate of AIDS infection is 0.3%. I can't do the math off the top of my head, but basically what that ends up with is if you test everyone in a large population, then maybe 90% of your positives end up being false positives. So the false positive rate of the test itself is very low, but when you implement it across the entire population, you end up having virtually all of your positives end up being false positives. So this is why universal screening on almost every measure is, I, I mean, no one in public health advocates this because it's all biostatistics, so they're coming from a statistics point of view and epidemiology, but anyway, if you do the same thing here, you, you know, you can't just be like, we're gonna screen as well as we can for Twitter bots and then we're gonna ban them all, you'll end up like 99% of the accounts that you ban are gonna end up being some kind of real people. So there's a high cost for po false positive enforcement. You know, if you ban somebody, then they might sue. There's, you know, you get bad press, you get congressmen railing against you. So it's, you know, it's politically intractable, it's practically intractable, it's not consistent with the way that other fields like public health approach these questions. There may be specific situations where you know, like you have a law enforcement action and you know that there's a specific group of accounts 
and you need to do something about that. You have subpoena power, you have that sort of thing. So I'm not saying to not cooperate with law enforcement and defense measures when they're carried out through due process, but just this like background screening thing is really just not as good as people like to think it is. And that goes for equally for you know, hate speech, you know, Nazi imagery, like whatever you wanna call it, if you, you, know, you train some model, it has some percentage of false positives, some percentage of false negative, you start running it on everybody, it, it really just doesn't work as well as people wanna think it does. What, the, what you can do, what the, what the tech companies can do is they're in the unique position of being able to decide what is slightly more amplified and what is slightly less amplified and you don't need to know absolutely for sure if you're just slightly bumping things up and slightly bumping things down. If something is coming through and it's consistently bad on some measure over and over and over again and each time it's bad you bump it down a little bit, then you can sort of converge on a better outcome without these extreme measures that have high cost for incorrect decisions. And you can do that at the trend level instead of the individual level because based on what I was describing before, if you see that the hashtag Pizzagate or whatever is following this pattern where it appears collectively that this trend is being amplified in an inorganic way that you're tracing back to suspicious sources, then you can kind of just slow down the spread of it and then maybe it won't be a useful tool anymore. Now that means a campaign level signal, not an account level or content level signal. You're focusing on a new entity that only makes sense once you start visualizing this battlefield as an information battlefield. You're not focusing on the individuals and you're not focusing on the packets, you know, the a Facebook statuses or Reddit posts or whatever. Like you're not trying to just find like, that's the bad one, I'm gonna kill that bad one. And you know, in order to find this, like I said, you, might, you may or may not need to trace it back to the origins. Personally, I would say that that technique that I was describing of using a fringe group to rapidly shift the Overton window, I don't want anyone to do that. I don't care who it is. I don't care if I agree with them or disagree with them. I just don't want to see people manipulating public sentiment that much. However, I also think that it would be very reasonable for the tech companies if they heard that specifically an adversary was thinking about doing this, that they should take that into consideration. Which incidentally, there's a trust gap, obviously, between the national security community and the tech community, which we all might need to work on. Good news is that these organizations like Softworks are especially well positioned for that sort of connection. Now, the government can and can't do certain things. Some people are like, Oh, Adam Schiff, let's nationalize Facebook, blah, 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 blah. I don't know, whatever. I, please, no. <laughs> the government in many countries does absolutely control content directly, and I would really, really like, I think I, I actually meant to put strike through over those top two, just to really emphasize that these are the things I do not want to see happening. I hope that it's not a hard sell for me to explain why I think these are bad government approaches. Now you get into a little more of a gray area. If there's propaganda going on, you're trying to fight the propaganda with counter propaganda, you run into a lot of problems there. The propaganda itself is just marketing. The very idea of propaganda is not illegal. Private companies do it all the time. You know, some startup, whatever. But the government really can't right now get into that business, and I'm not entirely convinced that I want to change that, but that's a discussion that I think a lot of people are having right now. Like I said before, the government can provide intel to the tech companies and say, keep an eye on that, feed it into your algorithms. I think that is a very productive conversation that could happen. The trust, well, in addition to the trust gap, one of the things that has to happen there is that it may be unusual for intelligence agencies to get used to the idea of giving handouts. And then of course, there's law enforcement activities. You have subpoenas and stuff like that. So when they know that there's something urgent going on, obviously there's an existing framework to you know, ask to turn over private information, et cetera, et cetera. So 
I'm still kind of working through this in my head, but I feel like there's kind of a landscape that you can map out of who the different players are and which way the information flow could start to happen right now, you know, without policy changes, without regulatory changes, like kind of right now, what could we do here? And then, like I said, there's a lot of interesting questions to be asked about how policies could be changed in the future. But I think I'm very interested in what could happen right now. So in summary, thank you for your attention. Economy, in a certain sense, that's why we are all here. The economy has become so much about attention and control of attention. That's what opened the door to a lot of this newly empowered and newly enabled possibilities of things that are really not new. This is new and it isn't new. We need to think in new ways. We need to fit the new way thinking within old way frameworks. We need to update the frameworks. There's a lot of work to be done. Thank you very much.